so good to see so many familiar faces in the groups of people who are, are watching right now. Uh, like Christine said, I am the lead project scientist and um, we're working on the North American Project to Evaluate Soil Health Measurements, which is a long name, but I think it really does a great job of encapsulating the task we set out in, to do in this project. Uh, we really are working on, to, on evaluating measurements used in soil health. And throughout this talk, I will be using nitrogen indicators as an example. So if you've ever heard me talk about soil health, you know that I need to start with the definition. Soil health is the continued capacity of the soil to function as a vital living ecosystem that sustains plants, animals, and humans. The reason I always start here is because it really guides my thinking as we're working on these evaluations of these measurements. So we, I use this to ask questions like, what measurements do we need in order to quantify the soil's capacity? How do these indicators interact to tell us something about function? And how can we use these measurements to say something that can help people make decisions about adoption of soil health management practices? So I'm going to start with a quick overview of where we're going. Um, and first, I want to say that we're building on a lot of work that a lot of other people have done. Um, and a big part of that in soil health has just been getting people to understand that soil biology is integral in crop production. And today you're gonna to hear um, more information on biology and Liz will have a chance to share some of the genomic data and share our approach to understanding more about the microbial community structure and function. Um, in others' work, soil health has rightly focused on indicators that land managers need um, in order to understand the effects of practices. But now, as we've heard from General Mills and others, there are so many people who are interested in soil health that we also want to expand the potential uses of these assessments to an array of different stakeholders. Uh, we've learned that inherent properties of the soil influence characteristics that can change with management. So the geographic breadth of this project is helping us determine how specific we need to be when we're grouping soils for comparisons so that we can interpret the changes in these managements. So we're working on that with this project. Um, and finally, there's been great progress from other groups um, with current soil health assessments that use relative scores based on averages um, so that you can make test results easier to understand. But today, what I'm going to focus on is this framework that we've, we're developing for soil health quantification, where we are working to compare particular soils to an appropriate target to determine how far along uh, the soil health path you are, and then how we're using these combinations of simple measurements to quantify the ability of the soil to perform specific function. So we talk about stakeholders here, right? And soil health is rightly focused on working with farmers and ranchers, but now there are so many other people that we need to expand the potential uses um, and think about all of these stakeholders. So who, who are they? Well, everyone, right? <laughs> but in this evaluation, we're really thinking about each of these different kinds of people who might want to use a soil health assessment and what information they specifically would need in a measurement. So one of the ways that we're doing this is by grouping them into categories to think about what they want from that soil health assessment. So we start with producers that we think have a range of production goals, um, and maybe they're focused on economic or environmental resilience, um, and that can take the form of a lot of different um, specific goals. And then advisors and educators, we think, want to be able to use information from a soil health test to help others make management decisions and really build that trustworthy relationship. Economists and analysts who want to use a soil health assessment need to be able to calculate the impact of management decisions, how that varies from place to place, and what might be an effective incentive program. Then there are the purchasers and consumers who want verification that the food they're buying is aligned with their value system. So they're also going to want to use a soil health assessment. And then finally, there are policymakers who want evidence that they're supporting effective programs. So I realize that there's more on this slide and there's a lot of small words, probably more than we can uh, really take in in a minute, but that's part of the point. There are a lot of different goals, a lot of different ways that we can use this. And so one of the things we've really tried to do is boil this down into two overarching questions. And the first one is that we, have, we see that there are those who want to use a soil health assessment as an indicator of progress. They're asking, is this management practice making the soil healthier? Is it moving it in the right direction? Uh, there are a lot of stakeholders who need a place to start. And so I'm going to discuss this in relation to moving toward a soil health target. And then answering the next question is where I think we can really start to see the usefulness of soil health evaluations um, and 
and increase adoption. Uh, when we consider again that basic definition, is the soil functioning to the best of its ability? Uh, some stakeholders really need to know about one specific function, and so there we are approaching this by quantifying specific functional outcomes. Because if we can quantify a job that a soil has done for us, then we can relate that to a direct cost savings. And when it comes to adoption of soil health management, we know that producers need that business case. So for instance, if we quantify an increase in the rate that organisms transform nitrogen in the soil to a form of nitrogen that plants can use, we can have confidence that even with an optimized nitrogen fertilizer rate, yield's not going to decrease. And that's going to increase our profits, which drives more interest in adoption of the practice that produce that tangible benefit. So I've talked a bit here about soil's capacity or functioning to the best of its ability, and I want to just dig into that for a second. Uh, not all soils are created equal. We have a couple examples here of four very different soils, and we have a pretty good idea that a mollusol in Missouri is going to behave differently and have a different capacity than an aridosol in Arizona. Uh, soils are formed in place over time by the surrounding climate, organisms, kinds of minerals or parent material present, and the landscape orientation. So all of these factors interact and they create a huge amount of variability and past research has shown that the extent to which a soil can change is limited by these inherent properties. So one of the things we're working on is comparing soils to some kind of target. We're working with minimally managed grasslands as a target comparison for cropping systems because they can tell us about the soil's natural capacity to perform these functions and give us an idea of what's possible. So our site in Pendleton, Oregon gave us a really nice example of this. This soil here pictured on the left is uh, from a system that has a moldboard plow come through every year for the last 80 years and has been worked in a typical wheat fallow rotation. At the same experiment station, there's also this uh, baseline grassland that gets mowed once or twice a year and that's all. Um, and these two pictures were taken on the same day after a hard rain. And you might be able to assume this from the picture, but our lab and field measurements of this grassland showed that um, that these beautiful aggregates and root structure, um, we showed here a sig significantly more water was allowed to flow in and through the system in this uh, target soil than in this business as usual, with a flow of 1.5 centimeters per hour in business as usual, compared to 32 centimeters per hour in this reference state. So taking these two bookends as a kind of measuring stick, we can look at another treatment at the same site where they've adopted two soil health management practices. They've integrated peas into the wheat fallow system and they do not till the soil. So you see here that the flow rate in the system is between the two bookends, flow of 12 centimeters per hour. Similarly, um, when we look at soil organic carbon, we see that the soil health management system is making progress toward that target. So the soil from the soil health management system has more carbon than business as usual. And the carbon is food for the microorganisms. The food allows the microorganisms to work and we can see evidence of that um, with the respiration. Respiration is a metabolic byproduct of microbial activity and so a good direct measure of that activity. Uh, and we can even see that the microbes are doing specific work for us. Uh, potentially mineralizable nitrogen is another measure we worked with, which is a good representation of how much nitrogen is made plant available. And then finally, we see that the practices are starting to increase that soil aggregate stability, which gets us closer to that spongy absorbent soil that will let water move in and through the soil profile. And so we see that for each of these indicators, the soil health management system is moving toward the target. Uh, we're also working to figure out what level of specificity we need to group soils so that we can have a reference base of soil health target ranges for anybody to use. It's been established that texture has an impact on the soil's ability to store carbon, which is related to just about every other soil health measurement. So using all of the unmanaged soils that we had in this trial, we show here the distribution for total nitrogen that fall, uh, for soils that fall into three broad textural groups, uh, coarse, medium, and fine. Uh, keying in here on this broad distribution of the fine textured soils, we wanted to know if any of this variation can be explained by regional differences. So the NRCS, EPA, U.S. Geological Services, and other organizations produced this map of ecoregions using inherent climactic and geological differences. Here we are considering and have shown ecoregion level two, 
of which there are about 40 in all of North America. And those familiar with the NRCS categorization, this is very similar to the major land resource areas. So taking the three ecoregions where we have the most samples and using total nitrogen again as an example, we see here that within the fine textured soil, there is a difference in the total amount of nitrogen within these ecoregions. With mixed wood plains here, represented in this part of the country, uh, south central arid plains and southeast US plains. So taking these, um, these categorizations into account, we think that this might be a pretty good way of uh, grouping soils for comparison. One of the other eval evaluations we're working on is this critical understanding of which measurements are needed and how many do we need in order to say something specific about a function. So here we have an example of an analysis called a response ratio. We take the data from all of the sites that have a reference state or target soil and measure the difference at the site between each treatment average and its target. That way we're controlling for the inherent features and can look at differences between a treatment and that specific reference site at many sites at the same time. So here this target or reference is zero, uh, this middle dotted line, and a negative value means a treatment has less nitrogen than the reference. A treatment set that does not cross this middle line means that there is a significant difference. So here we see that when it comes to uh, different kinds of nutrient additions, soils that have had synthetic nitrogen added have less total nitrogen than the reference. Those that have had organic amendments and uh, or just organic amendments tend towards having more total nitrogen but are not significantly different than the reference. And those that have had both organic and synthetic nutrient additions uh, there's no difference between that and the total nitrogen in the reference site. So when we do the same comparison with autoclave citrate extractable protein, which is a nitrogen measurement used in the Cornell assessment of soil health, we see the same pattern. Again, when we look at the N-acetyl beta-glucosaminidase, which is a nitrogen cycling enzyme that is recommended by the NRCS in their technical report, again, we see the same pattern. And then with the water extractable organic nitrogen in the Haney test, Again, we see the same pattern. So we've done these same kind of analyses for intensity of tillage and cover crops and cropping diversities. And we've done this with suites for carbon measurements and aggregate stability. And many of these cases, we see similar responses to management among multiple methods of measurement. And this kind of demonstrates the beauty and power of this trial. We have a lot of measurements over a wide range of soil health management practices and geographies, um, all sampled and tested consistently. So we can do this direct comparison and what we're seeing is that many of these measurements tell a similar story. So then we wanna move on to considering some of the logistical considerations, the cost, the time, the reproducibility, and the ability to relate these tests to specific functions. I wish I could spend a lot more time digging into this data because it's a really fun data set. Um, but at this point, I'm gonna skip ahead a bit to the punchline of where we're at so far. So I wanna iterate, this is just preliminary. We have not made any final decisions yet, but we have a pretty good idea of where we're going as we're trying to work toward determining a minimum set of measurements. Um, and so the first thing that we ask is, you know, is there a master variable that is influencing all of these, all of these soil functions? And you might get this idea that it is soil organic carbon. Most soil organisms are heterotrophs and they need that carbon for energy and food. So if it's not there, they don't have the tools they need to do their job. As an added bonus, measuring soil organic carbon with dry combustion, you normally get results for total nitrogen. So, not all carbon is the same, and in order to get an idea of whether or not the microbes are using that carbon to do the work, we also think it's important to measure soil microbial respiration. This is a byproduct of aerobic metabolism and the most direct way we have of measuring microbial activity levels. Then we want to know if they're using that carbon to build the physical structures they need. Aggregate stability is often referred to as a physical measure, but it's influenced by the organisms, the plants, the fungi, the bacteria in the soil that are creating habitat, and it's related to erosion and water infiltration and storage. So we think that aggregate stability will also be used in multiple ways to help us quantify soil functions. And we take these three measurements together and it tells us a really similar story as if we had measured 15 different indicators. And so we think that this is going to give us a good idea of whether or not a management practice is moving towards to moving the soil in a healthy direction uh, when we compare it to a target from a similar climate with similar inherent properties. Uh, and then these three indicators are also the start, starting point we're using for making specific calculations about soil function in consideration of these inherent soil properties and climate. 
So what I think is really exciting about this framework is that we're focused on, on using the understanding that a lot of different components of a soil system interact to produce a specific function. Uh, the premise here is that we'll use a couple of basic measurements in different combinations with different multiplication factors to predict each of these soil functions. Now, since I'm focused on the nitrogen indicators, I'm gonna talk about nitrogen cycling, uh, which is an active process carried out by microorganisms where they take that nitrogen bound up in the soil and turn it into forms that the plant roots can use. And I've used what's called forward selection regression models to test just about every measurement we made to see what increases the ability to protect predict potentially mineralizable nitrogen um, as the nitrogen cycling outcome. Uh, potentially mineralizable nitrogen is an expensive and time-consuming test, and when done in research trials, it's shown a very good relationship to the amount of nitrogen that's made plant available in a growing season. So what I found is that total nitrogen and CO2 24-hour uh, respiration tests is the best combination to predict potentially mineralizable nitrogen. And to me, this makes a lot of sense. You use the amount of nutrient present and the rate of activity of the microbes who do the work to make the nutrient available, and that's going to tell you about that nutrient cycling. So when we group soils by texture and ecoregion, that increases our prediction capacity, and overall it allows us to explain about 80% of the variation. So each project scientist uh, on our team has been working on evaluating a set of indicators, and so we're in the middle of working out some of these calculations. As we move forward in this approach, we will develop calculations for soil carbon storage, water delivery, water quality, um, and even maybe use our genomics work to relate these indicators to some disease suppression. And this framework is built to take a couple of non-redundant, meaningful, cost-effective, and interpretable measurements and use them in combination with the inherent features to calculate the soil's capacity of the soil to perform specific functions. And finally, uh, we're going to think all of our cooperators and financial support. And I think I'm probably out of time here. 